everybody. Yay. I'm absolutely thrilled to see so much interest about uh, this very dear to me um, diplomatic area, I could say, but also seeing the age prevailing. So I can see that the future of uh, cultural diplomacy is in safe hands. I'm very, very happy to see that. Um, well, I won't speak as much about Romania as about several things that I think I want to throw on your tables and in your minds, because I think that um, we are in a stage of the cultural diplomacy that requires a lot of food for thought and maybe a little bit of a metamorphosis, because actually the times press us to think of new forms. But let me start first with uh, several um, general considerations, because I was thinking of these because I really think that we live in times in which both governments and publics seem to take a, an, a bigger interest, a greater interest in cultural diplomacy. So that is why debates like this are very, very useful, and I'm very grateful to the Institute of, for Cultural Diplomacy for this initiative, as always. And that's why you will always have our support in this very noble, noble cause. So let me start with some general considerations, some general observation um, uh, based on my experience. There are serious challenges facing the arts in the current climate, but those challenges can be turned into opportunities with implications for the future evolution of cultural diplomacy. Arts funding is precarious, as you know very well, at a time of economic austerity. But this means that the relationship between culture and commerce needs to be reconsidered. Art professionals need to adopt innovative strategies while managing the right balance between public and private finance. In this context, we should always keep in mind that Corporate social responsibility, the CSR, as we call it in PR, is a key facilitator for cultural diplomacy. On the other hand, artistic innovation may often involve taking risks. Taking such risks requires strong cultural leadership. And again, having an academy for cultural diplomacy is a very welcome initiative and very, very timely. Ultimately, it is the dancers, singers, and artists uh, who capture the audience's imagination, but the need for sound and creative management is paramount. Dedicated training programs can and should strengthen the development of cultural excellence. On the other hand, sharing cultural experiences across boundaries is more than mere artistic change. Cultural diplomacy can be and was, in the recent times, a tool for challenging static realities and encouraging change, not only change of minds, change of political realities. In an increasingly globalized, interdependent world in which the proliferation of information technology ensures we all have greater access to each other than ever before, and creates new platforms uh, for the freedom of expression, cultural diplomacy is still critical and even more critical in fostering peace and stability throughout the world. And when learned and applied at all levels, it possesses the unique ability to influence the global public opinion and ideology of individuals, of communities, of cultures, of nations, which can accelerate the realization of the crucial principles constantly highlighted by the Institute for, Diplomatic, uh, for, for Cultural Diplomacy, and I will, I will mention them here. Respect and recognition of cultural diversity and heritage, global intercultural dialogue, justice, equality, and interdependence, protection of international human rights. We never have to forget about that. Global peace and stability. And I will end my, final, my, my general considerations with a quote, actually, from Mark Donfried's book called Searching for Cultural Diplomacy, because I think that this um, thought is essential, especially coming from a representative of a, of a government. And I quote Mark Donfried from your book Searching for Cultural Diplomacy. There is a great potential for governments to work together with civil society 
and private organizations, companies and individuals to create joint strategies in partnership with each other. This leads to greater neutrality, better reception by the foreign publics, and more effective participation of these publics in the respective programs and initiatives. The state should not and cannot disappear from cultural diplomacy programs. Instead, it fills an important role by ensuring that the private agenda of civil society groups work in tandem with the national interest, policy priorities, and challenges. End of exceptional quote. I completely agree. Well done. Well, in this context, let me mention and let me tell you a little bit about the European Union's uh, cultural diplomacy because Romania is a very proud and re relatively recent member uh, of the European Union and there is a, a certain concern um, and a current concern on how can the European Union and its member states maximize the impact of culture in foreign policy. And I thought it would be interesting to mention you a little bit the, um, mm, the brainstorming that's taking place these days, which shows us once again that we have to think and rethink cultural diplomacy. Well, Andrula Vasiliu, who is the Commissioner for Education, Culture, Multilingualism and Youth in the, Europe, in the uh, Commission for, uh, of the European Union, addressed this question in April 2014 at a meeting involving policymakers, cultural organizations, artists, and academics from 54 European uh, and non-European countries. This mixture is actually the present and future of cultural diplomacy, as I was uh, mentioning from the start. They discussed proposed recommendations by experts which could form the basis of a new EU strategy on the role of culture in the EU's external relations. And during that event, and Andrula Vasiliu said, and I'm sure that you will all agree, culture is a vital part of our collective European identity and helps to underpin our shared values such as respect for human rights, diversity and equality. Cultural diplomacy is an opportunity for us to share these values and our European culture with other countries. Well, this pilot initiative aims to promote better cooperation between member states and to maximize the added value of European cultural diplomacy. Increased cooperation between cultural institutes and civil society, partnerships between cities and the creation of European creative hubs in countries such as China and Brazil are among the ideas which have been under discussion during the consultations involving the Commission and the cultural groups. The meeting also discussed how best to help artists, producers, and companies to break into new markets outside the EU. But what is European Commission's role in culture, you might ask in your minds right now? Well, there is a strategic framework called the European Agenda for Culture. One important mention, with individual European Union member states responsible for their own cultural sector policies, that's very important because the, the members of the European Union are sovereign states who have their own culture, uh, cultural uh, policies and, of course, all those different beautiful cu uh, cultures that make so wonderful the diversity of the European Union. The role of the European Commission is to address common challenges, such as limits to the mobility of cultural professionals, barriers to finance, and skills deficits. The Commission is also committed to promoting cultural diverse, diversity, protecting cultural heritage, and supporting the contribution of cultural and creative industries to boosting growth and jobs across the EU. What does this involve? As outlined in the Commission's uh, cultural work plan, there are currently six main priorities that I would like you to, 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 to know. Promoting cultural diversity, intercultural, intercultural dialogue, and inclusivity, promoting and supporting cultural and creative industries, increasing skills and mobility, promoting and protecting cultural heritage and the mobility of collections, silent, put it on silent, don't forget, promoting culture in external relations, and developing reliable statistics and an evidence-based for the culture sector. Never forget about this. 
Otherwise, you cannot evaluate effects and needs. Now, let me shortly present you as another kind of food for thought, a trend that goes beyond the conceptual patterns of cultural diplomacy that we've been using until now. The vision of an organization, an American organization, since we're talking about you know, uh, the US and um, how they think in terms of cultural diplomacy, but I'm, I want to present you the vision of an organization called the World Policy Institute. Who thinks that policymakers and opinion leaders need creative ways to catalyze innovation and engage wider coalitions in solving some of the world's biggest challenges. By working with artists focused on the same issues, they launched a cross-cutting initiative entitled Arts Policy Nexus that seeks to build a new collaborative model for social change. I joined, I had the pleasure to join last year, a vibrant mixture of attendees reflecting the cross-disciplinary nature of a panel discussion entitled Beyond Cultural Diplomacy, Arts Policy Change, an event that was sponsored by, of course, by the World Policy Institute and the E1 Society. Uh, the idea driving the event and in a larger context, the cultural diplomacy movement is that every individual is both a diplomat and a citizen artist. What do you think? You like that, huh? <laughs> you like to feel diplomats and citizen artists, all of you, right? <laughs> Cultural diplomacy, a key component of international politics, entails a responsibility to support the arts through well-planned policy and to examine policy through the arts. These goals resonate with the World Policy um, Institute's Arts Policy Nexus project. Countless socially engaged artists struggle with the same problems as policymakers. And yet both camps often feel that the other has little to offer them. In response, the arts policy nexus seeks to engage artists and policymakers in meaningful and collaborative dialogues. And I want to present you a beautiful example that moved me during the panel uh, we all met Emad Salem, Deputy Director of International Programs at the New York-based Battery Dance Company, who leads the organization's Dancing to Connect program. Dancing to Connect produces week-long workshops around the world that pair individuals from both sides of a pressing local conflict. The seemingly incompatible participants collaborate to choreograph a dance and learn to see past their differences in the process. Salem emotionally recalled the performance choreographed by Israelis and Palestinians. After the dance, he told us that the students flooded the stage, crying, embracing, and celebrating their achievement without a, tra a, a trace of, uh, of their old antagonism. And examples are very many, including in my country, where a dance involved uh, kids from the Roma community, an ethnic group which is a social problem in Europe, and the ethnic Romanians. And the result was the same, a harmonious, beautiful, positive result. Well, in addition to being socially powerful, the impact of cultural diplomacy can be qualified and used to improve politics. A prime example of a new breed cultural diplomacy, Battery Dance Company seamlessly interweaves policy and the arts. The success of the program stems not only from its ideals, but from its methodology. Salem emphasized the importance of empirically evaluating uh, cultural diplomacy programs rather than claiming that the value of the arts is intrinsic and cannot be measured. Cultural diplomacy efforts should consider quantitative evaluation as a starting point for a dialogue between artists and policymakers. It is the common language by which the two camps can begin to understand one another and hopefully cooperate. It is not only artists and diplomats, however, who need to seek common ground. The concept in World Policy Institute's view, the concept of the citizen artist extends beyond artists and policymakers to include entire communities. I really think that this thought is revolutionary 
having in view especially the preeminent role of the public opinion and the increasing role of the public opinion and the role of the communities, I really think that this is real food for thought. The nexus of arts and policy will soon mature into a productive and challenging field of its own. Through their role as citizen artists, they say, individuals will be able to directly access and participate in both the arts and policy making. A strong collaboration between artists and policymakers could usher in a new level of civic engagement where every citizen participates in their political world. That's where we're heading to. Well, another way of transcending the conceptual patterns of cultural diplomacy consists, I think, and this is my final thought, in switching roles from promoters slash practitioners of cultural diplomacy to creators of cultural projects. And I'm happy to, and very proud, I have to say, to be able to give you this example that Mark mentioned involving a personal idea that generated the recording of a music album <laughs> called Ambassadors Sing for Peace <laughs> that includes world peace themed covers performed by, by five current ambassadors to the UN. <laughs> we have group songs, duos, trios, solos, performed in English, French, and Spanish. You can see how proud I am, right? <laughs> well, I started this project due to my passion for music and for my due to my passion for public diplomacy that I've been practicing, as you could see in my bio, for like 20 years. While I was inspired by the words of Hans Christian Andersen, who is a, I presume you know, having of your age, you must have listen to his fairy tales, right? But he had a beautiful way of, um, of uh, saying that when words fail, music speaks. You know it, <laughs> perfect. Well, I have to confess, this is a very personal thing and it is a dream come true uh, for me because since my arrival in New York, I've been trying to, I had all sorts of crazy ideas to make a, an ambassadorial band. Um, <laughs> well, anything, anything, any other mean um, of gathering a few ambassadors to convey the message of peace in other ways than from the UN rostrum where we have to, you know, deliver our speeches in a very solemn and, of course, serious and uh, grave pose. But you can do it. You know, even, even ambassadors are human beings, you know? <laughs> and they can do it their own way and, in a, in, and also in another way. So we all know by now that diplomacy and music create perfect synergies in spreading the spirit of, of peace. And I'm so happy and I'm so thankful that actually I found the right partners in this endeavor. I found, actually I thought of a regional coverage, okay? So I had, I wanted to have all the continents involved. So. I had, at the start, I had uh, the, uh, the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea for Asia and the Republic of New Zealand for Australia and New Zealand uh, included in the project. But unfortunately, the Security Council messed up our plans and unfortunately because of the professional burdens that they had at a respective time when we could in two weekends have the time to record, to rehearse and record, they had to leave the project. So I'm, but they were all the time along the way. The ambassador of the Republic of Korea was supposed to sing Imagine, and he used to sing beautifully. And the ambassador of New Zealand, um, a beautiful song called um, Where, Are, um, Where Are All Our Flowers Gone by Peter, Paul, and Mary. Anyway, the remaining continents and the remaining ambassadors in the project are the ambassadors of Canada for North America, the ambassador of Cap, the former ambassador, unfortunately, of Cap Verde, representing beautifully Africa, the ambassador of Costa Rica, well, the recently former ambassador of Costa Rica, he just left us a few days ago, the ambassador of Costa Rica who represented Latin America, me representing Europe, and the ambassador of Nauru representing the ocean, <laughs> <laughs> the islands. So another main partner in this, because that's why I give you this example, because it's a mixture of government, NGOs, and artists. And I really thought it's, it's, a, it's a good example that I could present you. 
uh, we had in this equation also the Friendship Ambassadors Foundation, who is an excellent American foundation devoted to promote peace through music. We had uh, the SAE Institute. You might know what SAE Institute means. It's actually the biggest university chain in the world, 57 universities in 57 countries. It's a technical institute that prepares all the sound and video engineers from the show business. So it's a very important uh, organization for the, the entertainment world. And last but not least, the Emmy awarded uh, and Emmy winning uh, musician Gary Fry, who actually used his magic wand, made the arrangements and made us believe at least for a few hours that we are, can really sing. <laughs> I have to tell you, we have some cool arrangement because for instance, I have a dream, a song by ABBA is performed for the first time in a bachata pace <laughs> or blowing in the wind performed in English, French and Spanish. Well, there are some novelties. So this is an example that we really could cooperate, you know, um, in, in, in such cultural projects. And of course, we are a few amateurs we like to think that we are the best singers out of ambassadors and the best ambassadors out of singers. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you sur are surrounded by professionals and you try to go to a decent professional level, well, you can because it is a successful uh, CD. I have to say that I will never forget the launch at the UN where the room was full of my colleagues, the ambassadors and senior high officials at the UN. Don't ask me how I felt, how nervous I was, but the love and respect that came from the room inspired us very much and it was an absolutely unforgettable evening. There was a, there was a chain of reactions. There was a huge international media coverage. I will give you only the example of National Public Radio who syndicated uh, an interview with us you know, National Public Radio being the biggest media organization in the US, right? They syndicated it to their 945 radio stations all over America. So if you Google Ambassadors Sing for Peace, you will see pages, you know, of, uh, of the local stations uh, who uh, syndicated our interviews. So I really think that our message was conveyed, maybe in a more attractive way than our boring, they say, some say, speeches. I don't think so, but that's a necessary professional duty, but when you can complete it with something like this, it has a fantastic effect. The CD is on sale on Amazon.com, iTunes, <laughs> CDBaby.com, at the UN gift shop. I mentioned this not in, to encourage you to buy it, but I want you to know, having again in view the age prevailing in this room, that all the proceeds go to youth programs and scholarships um, developed by the Friendship Ambassadors Foundation. So, we broke the traditional patterns and we were successful. We, of course, at our modest level. Um, that is why I, my final thought is that I encourage any creative initiative for the sake of constantly multiplying and diversifying the means of expression and the ways of action for the sake of cultural diplomacy. And let me and, uh, and leave you actually with a thought coming from a prominent Romanian, uh, the Romanian sculptor Constantin Brâncuș, who by very many experts is considered to be the most significant sculptor of the 20, 20th century. He has a slogan that's my personal slogan and I love to share it with you. And I really think it applies uh, perfectly to the spirit, the topic and the ideas that I want to leave you with from this conference. He, his slogan and my slogan is, create like a god, command like a king, and work like a slave. Thank you. <laughs> Let's hear a sample. Well, I, I don't think that we can speak here about ideologies. The only ideology should be harmony and cooperation between government and the civil society. And that is why I found it so important to see you in the room, because you can contribute significantly to the molding of such an approach that actually is the key of the future of cultural diplomacy. Governments are ever poorer, resources are ever smaller, uh, unfortunately, there is a lot of politicization in, 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 in contrast with what it should be. 
And unfortunately, the economic austerity also affected the, 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 the academic world, the arts world, and the NGOs. So, and I went here at this mission through the, the, the very uh, rough financial crisis of Romania a few years ago. So that's when I thought of this CD. So the lack of resources actually makes your creativity, it sharpens your creativity, I think. So that's why I'm thinking that uh, the future of cultural diplomacy is possible only with this mix, because otherwise we will collapse. And uh, in terms of financial resources, not having that luxury that some countries have, and even those, they are actually managing their resources very carefully. Um, we have to be more creative, as I said, find more ways, more diverse ways to promote this. And it can come from you if you think that the current generation doesn't do the best job that, you know, in this respect. Of course, as you said, it takes time your generation, learning from our mistakes and taking a profit of what we already built because we built a few interesting, you know, we put a few bricks on, on, on this, uh, on the foundation. You can evolve from there. So I warmly encourage you to do it. We will always be there for you, our generation, but the world is changing so fast and you are, of course, much more receptive than us to these amazing changes. All this virtual world that you know sucks us in uh, has to be taken into account in <coughs> changing you know the tools. So without you, we're lost. So please, uh, let's do um, a part, also an intergenerational partnership, which is essential, I think, these days. Well, as I mentioned the Roma people who are actually the gypsies, you know, but in 1993, the Council of Europe decided to call these people Roma. And the language is called Romane, Romani, okay? But it has nothing to do with Romanians. Uh, the gypsies, the Roma people, emigrated a few centuries ago from India, so it has nothing to do with our Latin roots. They actually came in Europe, and it's not only, first of all, there is no conflict between Romanians and Roma. Uh, the Roma people is, or the social integration is actually an European problem because they are present in every country in the European Union, or in Europe, also in the countries who are outside European Union. And it's not a conflict, it's about some difficulties in the social integration of Roma into the societies in the respective countries. So, no conflict whatsoever. Um, I think that, and actually we did this in Romania, I think that uh, the leaders of the Roma community, who are absolutely exceptional, we have, for instance, recently elected one of them in, for the European Parliament to represent the interests of the Roma people in Romania in the European Parliament. So using the elites of the Roma community, the elites having the credibility in front of their peers, but also the, 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 the intellectual envergure to convince, you know, uh, policy makers about the problems that, or maybe about the solutions that have to be found together. So, using the elites and taking a profit of the amazing cultural heritage that the Roma people bring in. I mean, I don't know if you heard of Fanfar Chocrilia, maybe, as I have Romania, maybe you heard of it. The Fanfar Chocrilia is um, a, a, a brass band that is uh, composed strictly of very poor Roma people from a very remote village in Romania who are now considered by the National Geographic the fastest brass band in the world and two years ago they were invited to perform at the um, a Nobel Prize ceremony in Norway, okay? So we can talk about talent and value. So bringing all this together, policy, arts, we will find a solution. I, I have to say that there were several European strategies regarding the inclusion of Roma people. I think that we made some progress, but there is still a, a long way to, to go. And also, these projects, as I mentioned, the project of the Battery Dance Company, these little things, you know, little things can make a huge difference. Never consider when maybe you will be discouraged by some people who don't trust you because you're too young, Never be discouraged because the little thing that you do can have an 
absolutely amazing and unexpected impact. So go for everything, go for it. Never be discouraged and be fearless. And please come to Romania to honor your roots. <laughs> you, you will have a lot of fun, trust me. Well, I'll try to, to respond to you in a nutshell, and maybe if you want, uh, we can uh, um, uh, have later a dialogue uh, on virtual basis. Well, in 2007, Romania joined the European Union. Uh, we felt like at the times of the revolution, uh, the Romanian revolution took place 25 years ago, and we have a very dear to our hearts anniversary this year, when we celebrate the start of the new Romania. But, uh, you know, at the revolution and in 2007, we had the feeling that now happiness will prevail, everything is easy, milk and honey will be there for everyone and the gates of heaven will, will suddenly open. It was not the case. So joining the European Union meant a lot of responsibility of not only uh, uh, honoring but maintaining the very high standards from the economic, social, political point of view. So maybe you will find in Romania some people who don't have, you know, the, the understanding of the fantastic long-term impact of our membership of the, on the European Union because the living standards are not spectacularly, cha spectacularly changed, such a big difference. And in terms of economic development, let me mention you only one example. Uh, during the uh, last two quarters, Romania had the biggest economic growth in the European Union. So I'm very proud to mention this. So joining the European Union was a fantastic stimulus for us in terms of, of uh, dynamism, activism, responsibility, and of course productivity, because without productivity you don't survive these days. So uh, uh, a fantastic impact, I would say in two words. Well, in terms of uh, creative things, well, you cannot stop the youngsters, and not only the youngsters, many, many Romanians now who are free to work in other countries of Europe do so because, of course, again, um, the living standard is comparatively lower in Romania. But what I want to tell you is that I'm very proud of them. It's not a loss for Romania. Uh, there are some social consequences, for instance, which are very serious related to the kids who are left behind and the parents are working abroad, but they are enriching the countries where they go. According to one of the last Eurobarometers in the last years, uh, guess who was on the top of the most hardworking and more, most adaptable um, uh, uh, employee in Europe, in the European Union? The Romanians. Exactly. So, um, trying to attract them. Well, we, they will be attracted automatically when the living standard will be much better. And the youngsters, I'm very proud of the creative industry in, in Romania because actually creativity, I think, is one of the main assets of the Romanian nation. Don't forget that, I don't know, in terms of IT, the second uh, spoken language at Microsoft after Hindu is uh, Romanian. Maybe Chinese is competing with us now, but uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, it is a fantastic asset. Um, we constantly try to find ways of bridging, you know, this, all this elite there are 900, by the way, by the way of this, there are 900 young Romanians on Wall Street who are graduates of Harvard, Princeton, MIT. Uh, there are Romanian elites everywhere. So maybe connecting them with Romania, maybe if they don't come back, because that's a reality that we have to face, they will always be those Romanians. Oh, that bright Romanian who made a great movie when he taped the, uh, the uh, uh, Institute for Cultural Diplomacy's <laughs> conference, right? They are agents of the Romanian image everywhere they go, in positive terms and sometimes negative terms, because every nation has, you know, this, this problem. But the important is, is, of course, trying to bring them back, but what we can offer now, economically speaking, cannot compete with the choices that you have after graduating Harvard in America, in the, at the best university in the world, but making these bridges, uh, keeping them turned with their hearts towards Romania and with their minds, maybe doing projects together that can bridge, including the two countries. What we like, like to say, for instance, with the American, uh, the, the Romanian American community here, they, we encourage them to grow American wings while honoring their Romanian roots. And this is the philosophy uh, prevailing in this respect regarding all the Romanians abroad. And we are about 10 million. Oh, with a visa, that's another technical <laughs> issue because visas actually are 
uh, European Union requirement. It's not up to, the, to Romania to decide being part of the European Union. But yes, exactly. Slowly but surely we will get there. Our heart and mind is very open to the world. Thank you so much. It was so wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much.